Okay, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Kiddush and Daf Ayin Dalid. Today's stuff is dedicated to all the families in Israel who are going through immeasurable suffering over the last few weeks. Our hearts are with you. Um, okay, we are now going to, uh, before we start, I just want to announce about the Siyum. It's been a little bit a little late in getting the seum going, but we are planning a seum. It's Rath Hashem, we're finishing Kiddushin next week. So the seum will be, I think I mentioned it once before, but I'll mention it again on Sunday, November 5th. The registration has not gone up. It should go up by later today. Um, so you can check on the website, or if you're in the WhatsApp groups, you'll get a link to register. Um, if not, it'll be up soon, but God willing, it will be on November 5th. Racheli Shbrecher Frankel is going to be speaking at the seum, and uh, looking forward to having a very meaningful seum and appropriate for the times that we're going through right now. Um, okay, I think that's it for announcements. There might be a few local siyumim going on. If Basically, our siyumim this time are going to be the Hebrew one will be on Zoom and the English one will be on Zoom. The Hebrew one will be on Thursday. Um, as I mentioned before, on Friday morning next week, which should really be the day of the last day of Kiddushin, since it's Friday and we're not learn- we don't need to learn the last daf because we'll learn it at the siyum on Sunday, we'll be doing the first daf of Baba Kama. Okay, as opposed to posting it on the Shabbat daf, we'll do it live on Friday morning on Zoom. So anybody who wants to join can join the Zoom for the Shabbat daf. And as usual, it'll be up on Friday morning for Shabbat for those who aren't on the Zoom. Okay, getting started with our daf. We're dealing now with issues of who is believed about what. So in all situations we talked about is a, 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 a midwife is believed to say which of the twin twins came out first, or if there's different children, she can say this one was a Cohen, this one was a Levi, etc. But to an extent, right, we said only when it comes to the Bechor, only immediately after that, we're worried that she might get confused. And really what we're dealing with here and a lot of the sugyot today, part of them have to do, at least in the first part of today's stuff, have to deal with memory issues. Okay, so for example, Ne'eman Bala Mecca, we're now at the bottom of Ayin Gimla Mubet, someone who is selling an item, they're believed to say, Let's assume someone gave him money for a purchase or someone gave her money. And that storekeeper is believed to say before they, right now they want to give the item and two people claim, I, I bought this item from you. So the storekeeper is believed to say, no, 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 I know it was you who bought it and not the other person. But they're only believed in which case, again, how long do we assume a storekeeper will remember who bought what? As long as the item is still in their hands, then it will work. Let's say I own a store and I sold an item to someone, and then next day two people come fighting over this item and they say, Hey, Michelle, you know, we bought this from your store. Each one claiming I'm the one who bought it. At that point, I'm not believed. Because my the assumption is if I already gave it to the person, I put it out of my mind. I don't remember it anymore because why do I need to remember who bought things yesterday from my store? Right? What do I need to remember? If I still have to give the item to someone, I'm going to remember that you're the person that I sold it to so that I remember to give you the money. But if I already, if you already gave me the money and I already gave you the item, I don't need to keep this in my memory. Right? I clean it out of my memory and I move on. So we don't assume that the next day I'm going to remember. To which they say, what do you mean? I still should remember because I should probably still remember who gave me money. If one of them paid me and one of them didn't pay me, I'd recognize, I'd say, wait, you look familiar, you don't. You didn't ever give me any money. So, in which case, I really should be believed even later. To which they say, No, it must be that I got money from both of you. But, But one, I intended to sell to you. The other one, I said, no, I don't, let's say, you both wanted the same item. I only have one in the store. I agreed to one. The other one insisted, and I said, listen, I, I don't, I can't sell it to you. I already sold it to somebody else. And then they insisted and gave me the money anyway. So at that point, the next day, I might remember that both of them gave me money. I just won't remember right, which one gave me the money that I agreed to the sale with and which one didn't. So again, that would be if I already gave the item. If I didn't give the item yet, then no. But if I already gave the item and they both gave me money, then when they come back the next day or whenever it is, I'm not necessarily expected to remember which one. Okay, so that's the case. And then I'm not expected to remember which one gave it to me that I was willing to sell it to and which one I wasn't. Next case. A judge is believed to say, we had a case in court and you were the one who was responsible to pay the money to the other guy. But when is this case? When, what case? This is if they're still in court. 
Okay, we had a ruling, I ruled, and then a few minutes later, you're still in front of me, and then there's a whole debate. So I said, what do you mean? I said, you're, right, you're supposed to give the money to me. And the other one said, no, you're supposed to give the money to me. I can be believed to say no, you and not you. But once they leave my courtroom, I'm not expected to remember who, what, right? How many cases come in front of me a day? How am I supposed to remember who was guilty, who was innocent? Now the Gemara is going to have two questions on this. Why don't we just... Isn't there... Don't they write down a ruling from the court? So why don't we just take out the records? It must be a case where the records were torn up for some reason. Well, if we really don't know, then why don't we just say, let's just bring them back and I'll judge them again. And the assumption is, if I ruled that you were innocent and the other one was guilty, right? You have to pay money. Uh, you have to, you're supposed to get money from the other person. Well, basically, we'll just do it again. And obviously, I'll come to the same conclusion. So why don't, it, right, if it's a case where they already left and we don't know, why don't we just re-judge the case? To which the answer, we're talking about a case where it's up to the judge's discretion. In other words, now here there's a big mechlok at Rashi Tosa. Rashi says it's up to the logic of the judge. Sometimes there's not enough evidence and the judge just has to use their common sense to make a decision. To which, to, and then, therefore, if we do it again, it might not come out the same way. Tosa says, what do you mean? If I'm using my common sense, chances are I would come to the same conclusion. So Tosa says, should the dedayne, and this comes up, by the way, a big machlok about what should the dedayne is anytime we use it. Sometimes, Tosa goes more in the direction that this is something that really, it's sometimes arbitrary. The judge can arbitrarily choose who's going to win when it's not so clear, because of Hefker, Beit, and Hefker, they have the rights to move money from one person to another, even if, you know, really there's no reason in which case, since it wasn't necessarily done by such a logical decision, more, not exactly impulsive, but it could be sort of a little bit impulsive, like it's sort of just up to the, the discretion to do it as they see fit. It could be that if we redid it, I might come to a different conclusion. Okay, and that's why they say in the end, that's why we're basically, right, we, the judge isn't, isn't believed and there's really no, right, there's no way to resolve it after that. Amrav Nachman. Now we're going to go back to this first point. There's three people who are believed for a Bechor, but each one for a different time frame. Okay, now you might remember we learned this law about Yakir. Okay, when it comes to the, the, the section of the Torah that talks about if a man has two wives, one is loved and one that he hates, which we mentioned a whole bunch of times, it says he can't right, decide that he's going to give the Bechorah to the younger son, to the younger son who's the oldest of the wife he loves, but it says, Yakir, he has to recognize the one of the older, you know, the, the daughter of the, the hated wife, to give him the double portion. Now, because it says Yakir, he recognizes he is the one who basically is believed about choosing who's, right, about saying this, this child is a firstborn. So whether it's twins and there's a little lack of clarity, which twin came out first, or, for example, let's say a man gets married, has kids, oldest son is a, is a boy, and then... You know, later on, they start discussing the inheritance, and he says, yeah, I'm going to get double portion. And the father says, what are you talking about? I have a son from a different marriage that you didn't even know about. He's believed to say that. That's usually the case, that you know, the father claims, oh, by the way, you might not have known this, but I have some son from another marriage, and therefore you're not the Bechor. So, Amrav Nachman, Shloshan Emanim ala Bechor. There's three people who are believed when it comes to Bechor. Elohen, Chaya, the midwife, that we already learned, which is only immediate. Chaya, uh, Aviv, Vimo, mother and father and mother. Chaya la'alter. The midwife is believed immediately. Imo kol shiva. The mother gets the first seven days. Okay, it, Whether this is connected to the bris or not, I don't think so. But the first seven days of the baby's life, we assume the mother's the one who recognizes the child much more than the father. The father hasn't had much access to the children yet to be able to know, again, we're talking, let's say, in a twin situation, who is who. But aviv la'olam. But once, and most people explain it, I'm going to go with this commentary, that the father, even though it doesn't say this, but only kicks in on day eight. Okay, before day eight, the baby's kind of more in the domain of the mother, and the mother knows much more than the father about things. Once day eight, it reverts to the Torah general laws of the father is believed. Okay, it's not to say the mother loses her credibility. It's just that the Torah basically gave the power to the father in this word yakir, which we're going to see in a minute, which means that the father really has jurisdiction. It's just that the mother has rights to do it the first seven days because the assumption is she knows the baby much more and she knows who's the Bechor much more than the father in those seven days. Kiditanya, again, that would really be in a case of twins. Yakir, yakirenu la'achirim. They say the word yakir here, again, it says, ki et Bechor ben hasnua yakir la'te lo pishnaim. Okay, the one who's the, who's the elder son of 
the daughter of the the hated wife, which is really he's the older one in general, according to the right in this case that the Torah is describing, Yakir Latelo. He recognizes him to give him the double portion. So now Yakir means he, not just he recognizes, you know, he can say it for himself, but Yakirenu Lachirim. He's the one who believed in front of other people to declare this child a, a firstborn. Mikan Rabbi Yehuda, and from here Rabbi Yehuda learned that man adam lomar zebni b'chul. Okay, so a father can say this one is the firstborn. Ukashem shenaman. Now Rabbi Yehuda takes it one step farther. He says just like a father is believed to say my son is a b'chur, kach neaman lomar zeben grusha zeben chalutza. He can also say this is the daughter of a woman who was a divorcee with me. I'm a kohen. And you might not have known this, but she actually was divorced before she married me, or she did chalitza before she married me. So he's believed to say that, okay? Just like he's believed to say, so they, what Rabbi Yehuda does is he extends this din of yakir, not just for bechol, also for disqualifying his son from being a kohen. Chachamim, we may know Naaman. Chachamim said, no, no, no. Yakir is specifically for firstborn. It has nothing to do with saying your son's pasul. And if it's just the father's testimony saying, Oh, by the way, my wife was a divorcee and his mom was a divorcee. We don't believe him. Unless there's witnesses that saw she got divorced, we don't take his testimony. So there's a machloket about that. Now we're going to go back to the mission. In the mission, we're going to still keep with this issue of Nehemiah, who's believed, but we're going to move it into a different area, which is in the mission. At the end of the mission said, Abishal hayakore the shtuki baduki. Okay, we talked about the shtuki, which is we know the mother, we don't know the father. And either she's unmarried or she was. Uh, betrothed but not married because right either she was totally single or she was betrothed once she's married we assume the baby is a case where we know the mother we don't know the father once she's married we assume any child she has the chances are it's her husband so we don't really have a suffix here but in this case shtuki it's a case where we don't she wasn't married so now it says that abishal called a shtuki a baduki okay so what like what the mission is just telling us he called the shtuki a baduki okay what, what's the meaning so my biduke, why is he call it a biduke? E lema, they're going to say, if you want to say, which usually rejects this possibility, but in this case, they're going to suggest this, raise some problems with it, but in the end, ultimately, this is going to be the way they understand it. What it means is a biduke means, biduke don't means to check. So what it means is when you have a shtuki, you check. How do you check? You ask the mother, who's the father? And if the mother says, the father was someone who is not a yichus problem, right? He wasn't a mom's heir. He wasn't, right, anyone I wasn't allowed to marry. Then she's ne'eminet, okay? She's believed, and then this child becomes 100% perfect, okay? We, well, the point of a shtuki is, if the mother doesn't say anything, then we, we don't know. But if we check with the mother, and the mother says, yeah, the father was a kosher person, then we have no problem of the yichus of this child. Now, if, now, let's go back. We were in the middle of a phrase. If you want to say that's the case, well, we have a problem. What's the problem? It's not that this is wrong. It's that we already learned this in another Mishnah. You might remember in the beginning of Masechet Ketubot, we had a whole slew of Mishnah where Rabbi Gamaliel and Rabbi Eliezer said, we believe this kind of claim. And Rabbi Yoshua came and said, Lomi pia anu chayim. we don't trust this woman to say what she's saying. And one of the cases are exactly our case. So now, if you're going to say that this woman's believed to say her kid's a kosher, uh, kosher status, well, we already have another mission that says this. And in fact, we know we paskin like the opinion that says this. So what's Abba Shaul adding? That's going to be our gist. So now they're going to say, Kima, Kira Gamliel. You want to say that Abba Shaul holds like Rabban Gamliel on this issue? Tanina Chadazimna. The mission already says this, and the assumption is where Rabbi Yudan Nasi put together the Mishnah. He doesn't need to mention two Mishnayot that say the exact same thing. Ditna. What does it say there? She's pregnant and they ask her, what's the nature of this child or the fetus? If she says he's from this and this person and he's a Kohen, which we learned at the time, it doesn't really mean he's a Kohen. It just means he has good lineage. They both say she's believed. Rabbi Yeshua says, no way, no how. We don't trust this woman. And we pass it like Rabban Gamliel. So now we're left with this question. If you want to say that's what Abishal is saying, we already know that we hold like Rabban Gamliel, and it's Rabban Gamliel's in the Mishnah there. Why would we mention it here? To which the Gemara answers, well, there's two issues here. If she was with a man who's disqualified, 
That, okay, let's say she had had a relation with a mom's heir, and this child is now going to be a mom's heir, or not, or was a good child. So if, right, she's claiming it's good. Now, if she's believed not to, now, there's two issues here. Number one is the child. What's the status of the child? Number two, a woman who has relations with a mom's heir or anyone who's disqualified, basically disqualifies herself from marrying a Kohen. So now we say the following. What does it mean she's believed? She's believed to what? To not disqualify her from marrying a Kohen or to not disqualify her child from being a mom's heir, right? There's two issues here. So, we have two Mishnayot about this. One is saying, if we only have one, we think maybe it just means that she's not disqualified from marrying a Kohen. We believe her for her own sake, but maybe we don't believe her and maybe her daughter, we have to assume, is a problem. So that's what Abishal was saying. He's talking about the child. The child is the Baduki, meaning you can check with the mother and believe the mother as regards the child. This answer that one is this and one is that only works if you hold, it works if you hold, that anyone who says, right, she's kosher, the mother, still, in other words, there's cases where we might not say the mother's disqualified, but we'll still say the child is disqualified. In other words, we might allow the mother to marry a Kohen, but we might not necessarily allow this child to be marry anyone they want. So if those two don't go hand in hand, that's basically what it's saying. There's one opinion that says those two things don't go hand in hand. Now then it makes sense that we have one mission talking about that and one mission talking about that. But but there is an approach that says, anyone who basically says, oh, we can assume you were in a relationship with a, a sexual relationship with a kosher person, then obviously means that the daughter's kasher. Those things go hand in hand. So if you say that she's okay, then the daughter's okay, then you don't need two Mishnayot to say those two different things because then it's all one and the same. So Abishal, my atal And so according to that track, what's Abishal telling us that we couldn't have derived from the first Mishnah? To which they're going to give a second answer. Again, there's two tracks. Either you say, one is to say she's okay, that's the Mishnah. She's believed about herself. And then our Mishnah is to say she's also believed about the child. But if you think those two things go hand in hand, you don't need two Mishnayot. So what's the answer? He is stronger than Rabban Gamliel in what sense? If we would have thought, if we would have had just the Mishnah in Ketubot, now I said the Shtuki could be from two types of relationships. Either she's not married at all, or she's betrothed to someone, right? But then we don't assume mo, you know, the, the majority of bi'ilot she has of, of sexual relations are with her husband. So therefore, it doesn't go by the husband. But those two are very different situations. So if you just have Rabban Gamliel and Rabbi, and Rabbi Lezer, you would have thought, hatam derov that's when she's single. And therefore, we trust her because the fact is, almost every man in the world is permitted to her, just not all the mamzerim, all the natinim, and anyone who's a relative, Right? Those would all create moms or children. But that's not the majority of the world. If she's single, the majority of the world is permitted to her. Let's say she was betrothed. You might have thought, if you just had that Mishnah, you might have thought, once she's betrothed, everyone in the world is forbidden to her, except for her husband. Right? And he's only going to be permitted once she's married. So in that case, since let, right, the chances are 99.9% .9 of the men in the world are forbidden to her right now. So there's more likelihood that the child's actually disqualified and and her. So therefore, Sricha, that's what our mission is coming to tell you. No, even if she's betrothed, we're still going to believe the woman. And Amarava Halacha Ka'abashaw. Okay, end of Surya. So what we did so far today, just to review this first section, is we started off with different people who are believed, a storekeeper, a, a judge, um, who's believed about a Bechor. Okay, right? What are the assumptions we make about which people, right, know the facts on the ground and will remember things, right? To what extent will they remember? To how long will they remember, etc. Then we talk about this Abishaul and what is Abishaul coming to say? And the, in essence, he's really saying the same thing as Rabban Gamliel, but in case, right, one is talking about one and maybe one is talking about, right, her or the daughter, or perhaps it's in the end that whether she's pregnant and she's single or she's pregnant and she's already, after she's already been betrothed. Okay, and maybe that's the difference, but in any case, it's saying the same thing. It's just including another possible case. Okay, now we're going to get to a bit more complicated section, and there's a, there's a study guide about this section of the DAF. So you can look at the study guide on today's DAF, which has a big chart about what's going to be between now and almost the end of the DAF. So we have, and I'll probably end before the next section. So we have four, we have a Mishnah, which is going to be a very complicated Mishnah to understand. It, it doesn't sound complicated, but 
the content is going to make no sense really or have several questions raised against it. And then the Gemara is going to suggest if four different rabbis are going to suggest four different interpretations of the Mishnah. Each one is going to be rejected except for the last, even though the last one in the end really changes the simple reading of the Mishnah. So here comes our Mishnah. It's a classic case where we have a mission that doesn't make sense, and then we have to figure out what on earth is going on. Okay, that sounds pretty simple. Anyone who can't get married within the community, right, is allowed to marry each other. Now, what's the problem? Well, that's basically what we said in the previous Mishnah. Like a mom, Zara, and a teen, and all those people, a Stuki and a Suvi, right, they can all marry each other. That's what the Mishnah had said. Rabbi Yehuda Osel. Rabbi Yehuda says, no, they can't. Okay, that's a little strange. When a mom, can marry a mom, there. Okay, we don't know what he's saying. Third opinion, Rabbi Leezer Omel, Vada'an Vada'an Muta. Okay, let's just assume we're talking about Mamzerim. A, a definite Mamzer and a definite Mamzer are permitted to each other. But Vada'an B'Sfekanu, Sfekan B'Vada'an, Sfekan B'Sfekan Asu. But you can't have a Sefek and a Vada, like a Shtuki and a, and a Mamzer. Or you can't even have a Shtuki and a Shtuki because one Shtuki might be a Mamzer and one Shtuki might be kosher. And then you're going to have a kosher person with a Mamzer. So he says, no Suffolk and Vada'i can mix in, even though we did say before a Shtuki can marry a, a, a Shtuki. And we also said a Shtuki can marry a mom's there. But he says, no, 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 those can't work. Ve'eluhan, right, so he has a different opinion here. Ve'eluhan asfekot, what are the asfekot that we're talking about? Shtuki, asufi, and kuti. Okay, he adds kuti to the list also, the shamurni. Because we're not sure always what their status is. So now we have to understand why this is Mishnah time out. First, we're going to raise a bunch of questions. And then as we move to Amubet, we're going to start with the four different opinions. My What does it mean anyone is forbidden to come into the community, right? Which we assume we know what that means, but it's a problem. It's that whole list that we saw in the previous Mishnah. We already just saw that in the previous Mishnah. So it's very clear. Anyone who can't come in is, married, is permitted to marry each other. We just saw that. So this Mishnah can't possibly be saying that because it's a repeat of what we just saw. Vitu. Question number two. Rabbi Yehuda Osel, what is he forbidding? Ahaya, on what is he referring to? Ilema vada'am besfekan, right? The obvious would be to say, he forbids a shtuki and a mamzer, right? He permits mamzer to mamzer, that's clear, because everyone does that. So what must he be forbidding? A vada and a suffix. Well, that's exactly Rabbi Leezer. So what could Rabbi Yehuda be saying that's different from Rabbi Leezer? Hamid Katani say for Rabbi Leezer Omer, vada'am bevada'am mutal. It must be Rabbi Huda holds something different entirely. So both those things raise problems. And question number three, now the obvious answer would be what? Now what do we know about Rabbi Huda? Remember we learned to Machloka Rabbi Huda, Rabbi Yossi about a ger that marries a mamzeret. Remember, so Rabbi Huda had said a ger cannot marry a mamzeret. So maybe that's what it means Rabbi Huda Osil. That a ger, remember, it's a machloket. Is a ger considered part of the community or not considered part of the community? If you say he's not part of Kal Hashem, then a ger can marry a mamzer. And that was, remember, the rabbis, Rabbi Zera taught that and got pelted with etrogim because people got all upset. That's very offensive to say about giving. But Rabbi Yehuda said specifically, a ger can't marry a mamzer. He says a ger is definitely part of Kal Hashem and therefore, of course, can't marry a mamzer. So maybe when it says Rabbi Yehuda Osil, that's what he's saying. But what's the problem? What is the language of the Mishnah? Right? Midi gerba mamzeret katani? Kol asurin lavo bakal katani. It says specifically all people who can't come into the community. That obviously doesn't mean only converts, because if it was only converts, it would have said converts. Right? It doesn't mention converts at all in the Mishnah. It just says all those people who can't come in the kahal. Now, by the way, a ger can come in the kahal also. So it doesn't make any sense, because a ger can marry a, a levi, a Yisrael, right? A, a giorit can't marry a kohen, but even a ger can marry a bat kohen. So it's weird, okay? This doesn't make any sense. The first two answers are going to basically say that we are talking about a ger shenasa mamzeret, and they're just going to have to explain what do the words mean, kol shasulin the baba kahal, and how does it refer to ger. So I'm a rabbi huda, turning now to amabet. Haki kama, this is how you should read it. Kol ha'asurin lavo bekahal kehuna. He changes this to say, all who are forbidden to marry kohanim, like a giyoret, okay, like a convert. My mind ninhu, who is this? Giyoret phutami bat shalosh anin v'yom What they're basically saying is the Mishnah is referring to a convert who converted from the age of three and up. U, I'm sorry, even under the age of three and up. 
Okay, this is just an aside, and we're going to talk about this aside for a minute, for another two more minutes here in the Gemara. But what they're saying is, if you remember, we had this whole discussion about a convert. A convert, a female convert, who converts under the age of three, okay? So she never, okay, let's go to over the age of three. Over the age of three, a woman potentially, according to halacha, again, hard to understand this always, but according to halacha, a woman theoretically is what we call ru'uyalabiya. She could theoretically have sexual relations. She's developed enough that there's a, there's a meaning to a sexual act with a woman of that age. Again, not to say that one should or anything else, um, but potentially if someone were to, then yes, then we would call that sexual relations which means that there's a concern that if she wasn't Jewish, perhaps she'd engage from the age of three in sexual relations, which would disqualify her to a Kohen, because then she'd be in the category of a zona. So we basically rule any convert from the age of three and up, and as this is one opinion, from the age of three and up, is basically not allowed to marry a Kohen. Okay, now, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, so now we have this debate, what about if she's under the age of three? And in fact, we rule this way that even under the age of three, we don't, it's called kind of like low plug, we don't make any distinctions. Any girl who converted, it doesn't matter what age she converted, can already not marry a Kohen, okay? Even though theoretically she couldn't have even had B.I., even if she did, it wouldn't be. We just kind of rule, blanket, giorot, or not allowed. Female converts cannot marry Kohen. So now, what are they saying here? Let's go back to the beginning. Who is Asulin Lavo Bakal Kuna? That is... Any giyoret under the age, even under the age of three, okay? And not like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, okay? Because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai rules that only from the age of three is she disqualified to marry a Kohen. Okay, in a minute we're going to say, why did we have to say it like this? Why didn't we say just from the age of three and then it would match Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai? So we'll get there in a minute. And the point is, so now we're going to get to this clear machlok at Rabbi Yehud and Tanakama. Tanakama is Rabbi Yossi, that anyone who's a female convert, who converted, it doesn't matter at what age, is forbidden to a Kohen, again, against Rabbi Shem Reuchai, who thinks only from three, is forbidden to marry a Kohen, and is mutarim zebazet, right? In other words, mutarim lavo zebazet means she can marry a mamzer because she's a convert. And according to Rabbi Yossi, converts can marry um, mamzeri. To which, they, and then Rabbi Yehuda Oser, that's classic Rabbi Yehuda's opinion. Rabbi Yehuda says, no, she can't marry a mamzer because she's part of Kala Shem. To which, before we get to questions on this approach, we're first going to go off on, a, on an aside about this three-year thing and say, Why did you say it was from the age of zero? Why didn't you just say it's from the age of three? And then it would match all the opinions. It would include even Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. To which they say, no, they couldn't have said that because Im Ken Mitzida Tavra. We would have destroyed this explanation from within. Okay, what does that mean? Well, because if you say that, that it's only from the age of three, it would sound like the following. It would sound like specifically because she's three and she can't marry a coin, that's why she's permitted to marry a mom's here. But what conclusion would you come to? You would think though, if she converted under the age of three, and since it matches Rabbi Shem Rayochai, what would we say? Well, then she's permitted to the Kohen. And then what's the conclusion? If she's permitted to the Kohen, then she's forbidden to mom's here, right? This sets up that if you're forbidden to a Kohen, you can marry a Mamzer, which sounds like if you're permitted to a Kohen, you can't marry a Mamzer. Now, if you say that, Demuteret lavo bakal kuna, she's permitted to a Kohen, Asura lavo zebazet, but then you would say that she's then forbidden to Mamzer. Now, that's not true. The issue of the three and under three, over three, is only an issue for if she considered a, zone, a potential. Possibly she's a Zona, and therefore we don't allow her to marry a Kohen since we don't know anything about her history. But, Hare. But when it comes to a gear, whether a gear can marry a giyoret, a female convert can marry a mamzer or not, has nothing to do with the age of what date, what age she converted. And Arei Pchutami Bat Shadosh Anivi Yomacha, the Rabbi Shimon Rayochai, Muteret Lavo Bakal Kuna, she can marry a coin, but also Muteret Lavo Zebazet. She can also marry a convert, according to Tanakama, which is Rabbi Yossi. In other words, the issue of the convert and the three years is an irrelevant issue. So the Mishnah wouldn't make any sense if we filled in only from age three, right? She's permitted to a, she's forbidden to a coin and therefore permitted to mamzerim. It would sound like under age three, she's actually forbidden to, to mamzerim, and it's not true because again, not according to Rabbi Yehuda, but according to Rabbi Yossi, which Tanakama matches him according to this interpretation, right? That they go that she basically can't marry. Um, she can't. Sorry, she can marry. She can marry a mamzer 
even though she can also marry a Kohen. So this wouldn't make sense. So that's why they picked from birth, because they want an issue that applies from birth, and therefore it just doesn't hold by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. That was all an aside. But getting back to the main topic. So according to this, anyone who can't marry a Kohen is, right, like a convert, is permitted to marry a Mamzer. Okay, which basically means, in simple language, right, much simpler than the, than the Mishnah, gear, no say Mamzer. Okay, or, or Gioret, no say Mamzer. So now, we're going to have two questions with this. This is a, no, it didn't say a convert can marry a Mamzer here. It said anyone who's forbidden to marry a Kohen is allowed to marry a Mamzer. That's basically what the Mishnah said. So, Uklalahu, if you're going to plug in anyone who's forbidden to marry is marry a Kohen and not marry anyone, well, Klalahu, de Kolasurin, Lavo, Bukal, Kuna, Mutarin, Lavo, Sebaze, anyone who's forbidden to a Kohen is allowed to marry a Mamzer? That's totally not true. A widow who can't marry a Kohen Gadol, a divorcee, a, 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 a woman who did Chalitza, a Zona, a Chalala. All those women can't marry Kohenim also, just like the Giorit. But none of them are allowed to marry a Mamzer. A mamzer. So the rule, you know, the, the rule in the Mishnah is a general rule. So while we took it from Kahal, it doesn't mean Kahal, it means Kahal. Kohenim doesn't fit. It's not true. And furthermore, something else implied from the mission doesn't make sense according to this. Vitu, and furthermore, hamutar asu. Okay, what does this mean? And we're going to come back to this in another few minutes, so let's get it straight. The mission said whoever's forbidden is permitted, right? Who's forbidden to marry a Kohen right now, we think it is, is permitted to marry a mamzer or anyone in a right problematic category. Just using a mamzer as the example. Which implies that anyone who's permitted to marry a, anyone who's permitted to marry a Kohen is not allowed to marry a Mamzer. So now they say, right, that's mutha muta asul. If you're permitted to marry a Kohen, then it would be implied from this Mishnah that you're not allowed to marry a Mamzer. Vahagir shemutar bekohenet umutar bemamzeret. Now, let's take a male convert. A male convert can marry a Kohen, meaning can marry a female Kohenet, a Bat Kohen. And yet, is, not, is also allowed to marry a mamzeret, according to the Tanakhama's opinion. So the rule and the opposite of the rule, like the inverse of the rule, doesn't work. So basically, we have those two problems with this reading. So to resolve this problem, Rav, Rav Natan Bar Hoshaya continues in the same lines, but modifies it slightly. He wants to get rid of the, the, the divorcee and the widow and, and all those people who can't marry a Kohen or can't marry a Kohen Kadol, but also can't marry a mamzerim. So how, what is, how does he adapt it a little bit? This is what it says. It's, what it means is a Kohen can't marry this person's daughter. Okay, now what are we talking about? We want to still get back to the gear. We want to basically say the machloket in this Mishnah, and this isn't with, true with the first two interpretations, is we want to just get to gear. Convert, can't marry right a Kohen, but can marry a mom's here. So, and then Rabbi Yehuda forbids this, because Rabbi Yehuda forbids the convert with the mamzer, and then that works perfectly. But, how does he resolve the issue of the almana and the grusha and all those? Well, kol shekohen asur bito. If the Kohen can't marry this person's daughter, then that person whose daughter can't marry a Kohen can marry a mamzer. Okay, what are we talking about here? Umay nihu, ger shenasan giyored, uche Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. We're going to see this all in Daf Ein Zayin. There's a big machloket about child of convert can't marry, sorry, a convert can't marry a Kohen, right? A female convert. What about the daughter of converts or the daughter of a male convert or the daughter of a female convert? Does it continue throughout the generations? So Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov has an approach that if two converts marry each other, then the child also can't marry a Kohen, even though the child is a born Jew. But since both parents were converts, the Gear can't marry a Mamzer. I'm um, sorry, the Gear can't marry a Kohen, the Giyore. So that daughter. So now, that's basically what the mission is referring to. If you can't, a coin can't marry your daughter because you are a convert who married a, also a convert, and then the coin can't marry your daughter, well, then you are mutarin lavo zebazel. Well, you're a convert, right? You're the father, you're, you're a convert. You can marry a mamzer or a mamzer, right, a mamzeret or anyone who's disqualified. So let's read it inside again. Hachi kamar. This is the way to read it, according to Rav Natan Bar Oshaya. Kosha kohen asur lisapitof. The coin can't marry your daughter. Umayni, and what would be the case? 
Gir Shanasagi Yoredu Khurabi Eliezer Ben Yaakov. That would only match his opinion because he says this. Mutarin Lavo Zebaze. Well, that Gir, whose daughter can't marry a Kohen, he can marry a Mamzer. Now we're going to have a. And then this resolves the, the divorcee issue. Because a divorcee, if I get divorced and I have a child then after that, like I marry someone else and have a child, that child, of course, can marry a Kohen. They're just the daughter of a divorcee. Right? So that removes the whole question from the previous case. To which the Gemara, though, adds another question here. Well, there's more cases of someone whose daughter can't marry a Kohen. What's the classic case where the daughter can't marry a Kohen, but yet that person can't marry a mom's heir? Okay? The son of a divorcee and a Kohen is a Chalal. That Chalal who marries a Bat Yisrael, de Kohen Asroli Sabito. Now, the halal continues throughout the generations. And there's a big machloket about whether it does or doesn't. We saw this before. But right now, we're going to go by the basic opinion, which is a halal that marries a Jewish woman. The child is also, if they have a daughter, the daughter's a halal and she can't marry a Kohen. So that means there's another case where the, we have a father whose daughter can't marry a Kohen, but the father can't marry a mom's there. He's a halal. Right? A halal is just a squal, right? It's a problem for kahuna issues, but it doesn't mean you're outside the community and you can go marry people like Mamzerim. Of course not. So this is going to break the rule. So let's read it again. Hare halal Israel, de Kohen Sabito. The Kohen can't marry his daughter. Vasurin Lami but also can't marry a Mamzer. So they say, oh, that's not a problem. Lokash, yeah? Kirabido Staiben Yehuda. Because we could say that the Mishnah follows Rabido Staiben Yehuda, who holds. Now we saw this. That remember, Rabbi Dostai said the Beno Yisrael are mikveh tahara lechalalim, right? If, meaning, if a halal marries a regular Jewish woman who doesn't have a, a problem, right? Like a regular Israeli, the daughter of a Israeli, a Israeli, she can fix the halal problem. Meaning, it doesn't go down through the generations. So, if you say it's like Rabbi Dostai, then you would say, ah, here you have a case, right? We have a case of a halal, but he, he actually can marry his daughter off to a Kohen because as long as he marries a Yisrael, right, a daughter of a Yisrael, that fixes the problem. His daughter's not a Chalala. So now it's perfect. He is allowed to marry his daughter to a Kohen and he's forbidden to a mom's there. And that works perfectly. But that's the Hamutar Asul, right? Someone who's permitted is, not, is forbidden to marry a mom's there. But they have a better question. Even according to Rabbi Dostai, what did he say? If a halal marries a Bat Yisrael, a good, right, someone who's fine and all that, then it clears up the halal problem. But according to him, what if a halal marries a halala? Okay, we have two children who were born to divorcees in Kohanim. Hare halal shenasa halala, which for sure, Kohen asurlisa bito, right? Now, can a halal and a halala, can they marry, right? So their daughter can't marry a Kohen. And according to the mischief, the daughter can't marry a Kohen to what we're saying here, right? The second interpretation, then they can marry Mamzerim. But of course they can't marry Mamzerim. They're just Chalalim. Chalalim can't marry Mamzerim. So, so that's question number one. Doesn't work here. So we asked a question, we resolved it because of Rabbi Dostai. We could say, fine, a Chalal with a Bat Yisrael, you're right, isn't part of this category. But a Chalal and a Chalala, which would be a classic case of your daughter can't marry a Kohen, and yet you're not allowed to marry Mamzerim, and then that doesn't fit in the Mishnah. And same second question we had last time, the two hamutarasul. You can't say if you're permitted to marry off your daughter to a kohen, then you're forbidden to marry mamzerim. Hare ger shen asa bat Israel, a ger who marries a Jewish woman. Remember, we're talking about Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. What did he say? Two converts marry each other and have a daughter. The daughter can't marry a kohen. But if a convert marries a Jewish woman. Right? Then she's permitted to marry a Kohen. That's the Mutar case. Mutar li sabito, um mutarin lavo And that guy, the convert, he can't, right? Well, what did we say? Anyone whose daughter can marry a Kohen, he is allowed to marry Mamzerim. Which means anyone whose daughter can't, I'm sorry, anyone who can't marry a Kohen, who can't marry his daughter off to a Kohen, can marry a Mamzer. Which implies anyone who can marry off his daughter to a Kohen, like, for example, a convert who marries a Jewish woman, can marry off his daughter, the second part should be, is forbidden to marry Mamzerim, because he can marry his daughter, he's forbidden to marry a Mamzer. But he's actually a gear, according to Tanakam, is permitted to marry a Mamzer. That was the whole machloket between him and Rabbi Yehuda. So this uh, interpretation doesn't work either. 
So now we're going to leave thinking that this has to do with Kohanim, and we're going to try a whole different approach. Because the Kohanim thing and trying to get to Gareth through saying Kahal men, Kahal Kohanim doesn't work because there's always things that break that rule. Because again, the Mishnah was a general rule. So you can't say it only applies to convert and doesn't apply there. Third interpretation. El Amar of Nachman Amar of Ravua. Hacha mamzer ma'achotom, mamzer ma'eshet ishi kibinai. The Machloka Tanakama and Rabbi Yehuda has to do with a, mom, a child born to someone who sleeps with his sister and a child born to someone who sleeps with a married woman. What's the difference between them? Well, mamzer, okay, let's talk about, forget the child, just the relationship. A man mar- uh, has a relationship with a married woman, they get the death penalty in court. And there's also karet associated with it, like if the court doesn't penalize. That's the most severe because the court can kill you. That's severe. The second in severity is karet, is that, you know, God, a God-given punishment. That's mamzer, that's, a, that's a, a relationship. If you sleep with your sister, it doesn't say the court kills you. Okay? You get chenek, strangulation, if you sleep with a married woman, but not if you sleep with your sister. There you just get karet. Karet serious, but it's not as serious as karet and mitapeti. So they're saying that's the machloka between them. So let's read it inside. Tanakama sabah, afilu mamzer machoto nami havi mamzer. If a child is born from an isor karet only, not where there's mitapeti, you're also going to be called a mamzer. Okay? Meaning, even though it's only isor karet, you're still going to be called a mamzer. That's generally the opinion we've always been talking about. Isra Kare causes children to be mamzerim. Rabbi Yehuda Savar, me'eshet ish have mamzer, me'achotolo have mamzer. Rabbi Yehuda holds no. Only if it's death by the court or is the child going to be a mamzer. If not, the child's not a mamzer. So now, if that's the case, what's the mission teaching us? My Kamashman, if it's teaching us, right, that again, anyone who can't come to the kahal, okay, reading, anyone who is, doesn't matter if you're only mitapetin, even if you're chayvet kare. Then you can right. Then your child's a mom's there, in which case, right, that child can marry another mom's there. But Rabbi Yehuda says no, they can't because only if it's mitapetin is it going to be the case. But not if, let's say, a mom's there from your sister. The child born to a man who slept with his sister is not going to be called a mom's there. That's basically what Rabbi Yehuda is saying. When it says Rabbi Yehuda is there, that's what it means. But if that's the case, my Kamashman and Tanina, that whole thing appears in the Mishnah. We already learned this in Yavamo, you might remember. There's actually a three way machlok about this. Ezehu mamzer, what's a mamzer? Koshu below Yavo, Devre Rabbi Akiva. That's not even the one we're talking about here, but that's Rabbi Akiva who says even Chayve Lavim, right? Like any, right? A Kohen with a Grusha. Also the kid's mamzer. Rabbi Shem, or actually we had a whole debate if he includes these Surah Kiwuna, or is it just Lotases like, right, Yibum and some other ones? That would match Tanakama by us. Even if it's just Kare, that would create Mamzer, but not Yisrael Lavin. And by the way, they say, and we pass on like him. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, and that's why that's the opinion we always hear. Rabbi Yoshua Omer, Rabbi Yoshua says, any Mita Beitin only. If it's, only if it's Mita Beitin, is the kid of Mamzer. So it's the exact same Achloket. And number one, why would Rabbi Yudanasi bring two Mishnayot that are the exact same thing? Number two, and, and there they even have three opinions, so our Mishnah would be totally unnecessary. Number two, if that's the case also, our Tanaim were later. They should have just said, I hold like Rabbi Shimon Timni, and I hold like um, Rabbi Yoshua. And then that would have been a better way to say it. So Ella Amarava, so option three is rejected as well. Here comes option four, and with this we'll finish for today. Ella Amarava. Gil Amuni Movi Ikabinayu. What they're arguing about is a ger Mo'avi. Now, ger Mo'avi is not, if a convert from Amun Mo'av converts, they're not accepted to marry Jews. Remember, that's what we said. Now, they, right, they're not allowed to marry in. But now they say the following. There's a machloket about whether they're, so they're asurin lavo kahal. they can't marry Jews, but maybe they can marry a mom's here. That's the machloket. And then, right, mutarin lavo, so, uh, this is the way you read it. Which asulim are we talking about? Ger Amunimovi, converts from Amunimov. Mutarin Lavo Zebaze. They can marry each other. To convert, right? They can marry Mamzerim. They can marry people who are outside the community, even though they're Jews, but they're outside the community. So then Ihachi Amai Rabbi Yehuda Osel. So then what does it mean? So Tanakama says that Rabbi Yehuda forbids. What does that mean? What does he forbid? To which they say, this is how to read the Mishnah. And now, we're going to read the Mishnah totally not in the simple reading. The simple reading, until now, we've thought there's two opinions. There's ta- oh, there's three, but we've ignored Rabbi Lezer right now. But there's Tanakama, and then Rabbi Huda comes in, is Osir. 
So to which they say the following, Hachi Kamar. Even though Rabbi Yehuda doesn't allow. Remember, he says, Gerim are part of the Kahal Yisrael. They can't marry Mamzerim. But He comes and says, even though I forbid, right? Even though I forbid a Ger to marry Mamzerim, specifically a Ger who's not allowed to come into the Kahal at all, is actually going to be permitted to marry a Mamzer. Okay? And then, the whole thing is talking about a gear, but a very specific gear. A gear on Mani We go back to saying Kolasur Levoba Kahal is the general Kahal, but it's talking about a particular type of psul, which is the gear, the gear um, who's an Amoni Umbavi, which can't marry at all, right? Those, those giving can't marry the community, but they can marry Mamsirim according to Rabbi Huda. And that's the Rabbi Huda Osir means even though I forbid in general, in this case, I permit. It's a little bit, uh, really not the simple reading, but that was what we did. So the second part of the daf was all trying to understand this very confusing Mishnah. Again, Rabbi Lezer we're not dealing with because he's very clear. He's saying a Shtuki and a Sufi can't marry each other, can't marry a Mamzer, all that. Only a Mamzer and a Mamzer can marry each other, you know, things that are Vada'i. But the first two opinions really didn't make much sense, and now we basically came up with four different explanations. Is it Kahal Kohanim? Is it a difference between, you know, um, Mamzer... Of Chayve Kritu to Mamzer Chayve La, um, Mamzer Chayve Beitin. Is that the machloka between them, or is there, or is it really just saying that Rabbi Huda, even though he forbids in general converts to marry, he actually permits in this case the convert, the Amoni Moavi, to marry within the community, okay, to marry the Mamzerim. That's where we're going to end today. We'll start with this new Brita, which continues on the next page in tomorrow's staff. Wishing everybody a great day, and uh, hopefully a more peaceful one.